Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to join us today. We at Park Ave want to be a help to you, so if you have a prayer request or a question about today's sermon, fill out the Connect card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church, and happy Easter to you. It's good to be celebrating together. Uh, wanted to open this morning with just a powerful quote that I think is so impactful that Easter says you can put truth in a grave, but it won't stay there. And thank goodness that our Savior did not stay there. He is risen and there is so much that we benefit from as a result of that. Uh, we're taking a break today from the, our current sermon series, which is in the book of Ephesians, called Beggars No More. We will return to that next week. Um, but the overarching theme of that study is very pertinent to what we're talking about today. And that overarching theme is the idea that we have been given everything we need in Christ. He has made every spiritual provision for us as, his, as, uh, as our Savior. And it's a great reminder for us that without the resurrection, um, it wouldn't have been possible. He could not have made the provision for us that he has um, if he had not conquered the grave. And so uh, one last thing related to our fusion study, where this provided us with a perfect breaking point because our first six weeks of that study look at Ephesians 1 through 3 and tell us who we are in Christ. And starting next week, uh, week 7 of our study, we'll be beginning looking at Ephesians 4 through 6, the balance of that book that tells us how we are to live in Christ. So just a little uh, tease of where we're heading next. Uh, one other idea from that series that I want to correlate into today and that is this, that Christ's death had both vertical and horizontal purpose. And just for the sake of clarification, I really want to say Christ's death and resurrection had both vertical and horizontal purpose. Uh, the cross reconciled us to God and reconciles us to one another. But again, without the resurrection, that power would not be there it just would have been another tragic death, but it was so much more. Um, so for today, I want to introduce a couple of ideas for us. First of all, the cross brought heartbreak and hopelessness. That's probably not shocking if we look at the crucifixion account. Uh, it, is, it is brutal. It is brutal to look at. Uh, what Christ suffered physically, uh, the impact that it had emotionally and relationally on him, on the disciples, on his mother. Um, there's a lot of heartbreak. And I think it's important for us to remember that for the disciples, for Jesus' mom, for so many, they couldn't see any further than the cross. Uh, this was not the way things were supposed to happen. This was not the unfolding of the story they expected. And this seemed to have great finality for them. But the thing that is true for us that we are benefited, ben that we benefit to know about, is that the empty tomb brought healing and hope. And that healing and hope uh, continues to ripple out and affect us even today. And aren't we thankful for that? Um, a couple of things I want us to talk about. The first one, you're going to be like, well, isn't that kind of obvious? And yes, it is. But I think when we look at the Easter account, it can be so easy for us to forget that dead people stay dead. That's what we expect that's the norm. And so when Christ was arrested and beaten and crucified and died for his disciples and others, 
There was no other assumption they could make other than that it's over. It's over now. This isn't the way it was supposed to go. I don't understand, but it is over. Death typically is the end of someone's story, and they have no reason humanly to expect anything different. Uh, secondly, in the Gospels, those closest to Jesus documented their own disbelief. Uh, it's one of the powerful things about Scripture is if these men were making up a story or were embellishing the truth, surely they would have painted themselves in a more favorable light. And they didn't. Uh, Peter uh, captures the events of his betrayal of Christ, his denying him. Uh, the other disciples, uh, with rare exception, all ran and went into hiding. And uh, they weren't seen favorably. And, and to me, uh, that gives the account a ring of authenticity. Because that kind of honesty, uh, frankly, is not natural to us. Uh, so I think that's something important for us to remember. And lastly, this idea that when Jesus died, hope died with him. Uh, so much of what his followers had come to expect, and admittedly, they were consistently getting surprised and had things wrong and did not understand what Jesus was telling them. But this, this was final. This to their thinking was irreversible. They had no reason to expect that there was gonna be a happy ending here. And so what, what I wanna do this morning is look at seven verses out of the book of First Peter that Peter wrote. He wrote this years later after these events and it's interesting and it's very instructive for us the perspective that he brings. So just seven verses, we're going to work our way down through these quickly, make a few observations together. First uh, Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, it says, Praise be to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I love the contrast that is there, that we have a living hope. Uh, not just wishful thinking, we have a hope that is based upon a living person. And this is a living person who was put to death and refused to stay there. And why do we have this living hope? Well, it's available to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is a living hope, and that is powerful for us. We continue in verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Before we go on, uh, who gets an inheritance? Well, normally it's family. Normally it's children. And so it's important for us that, that Peter is making an assumption here, one that he is writing to believers, and he is reaffirming the truth that we, because of what Christ has done, we have been invited into the family of God. Uh, we did not belong there. We had no way to earn our way in. But Jesus Christ made that possible. And the inheritance that we are receiving can never perish, spoil, or fade. And I don't know if you've noticed that when you get something here on this earth, even something you're very, very excited about, uh, if you get a new car, uh, it perishes, spoils, and fades. It gets, um, gets some dings on it. It gets, uh, doesn't keep that new car smell stuff gets spilled inside and it just it's not very long before it doesn't look like it did when it was brand new and it's powerful for us to know 
that our inheritance is protected against those things because it is not an inheritance that is here. That's what we hit next. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So salvation is not merely a point in time event that you can point into your past. It is an ongoing that we are being justified. We have been justified. We are being sanctified. And someday we will be glorified. That's a wonderful truth for us. Verse 5. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. That's celebration right there. And uh, Easter Sunday is a great time for us to be reminded that we have much to rejoice in. But unfortunately, that's not all of verse 6. Verse 6 continues. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. Though, so that's a contrast word for us, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, there are several of my least favorite words in that verse. Suffer, grief, and trials. I'm not keen on any of those. Uh, the thing that helps temper that for me is, first of all, in all of this you greatly rejoice, and the phrase, for a little while. Now, when we are in the midst of suffering, grief, and trials, it does not feel like it is moving quickly. It feels like time has stopped, and this is never going to end. But Peter gives us some insight into a divine perspective that in all of this, you greatly rejoice, even though this other thing is true. The thing that will be true far longer is that we have reason to greatly rejoice. Verse 7. These have come, and these is referring back to those trials so these trials have a purpose, apparently. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. And then we have a parenthetical thought here. What about our faith? Well, our faith is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. So as valuable as gold is, uh, it fades. It is affected by all those things. It perishes, it spoils, it fades. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You see, Jesus Christ came to us once when he was incarnated. We celebrate that at Christmas time. He, he grew up. He taught, he did miracles, and then he laid down his life, shed his blood as a sinless sacrifice for our sins. Uh, he ascended into heaven, and he is coming back again. And that will result in praise, glory, and honor. So, uh, just to draw emphasis to this, Peter says here, that genuine faith is greater than, it's more valuable than refined gold. Now, in our economy, gold has great value. And we would think faith, well, that seems kind of, it's immaterial. It's not readily measurable. So how could it possibly be of greater value? Well, first of all, even refined gold eventually perishes. Uh, genuine, enduring faith does not. And secondly, while trials are not pleasant, they prove the genuineness of our faith, which results in praise, glory, and honor for our God. So our genuine faith gives us the means to persevere in times of trial. 
in times of grief, in times of suffering. Um, just real quick reminder that the power of your faith is not in how much belief you can muster up. It's in placing your faith in something and someone who is reliable, who is powerful. So the power of your faith is not in how much you believe. The power of your faith is in who you choose to believe. And if that someone is reliable. Uh, if someone here in our church had difficulties with their car and needed repairs done and came and said, Pastor Mike, uh, will you fix my car? I have faith that you can do it. Um, it doesn't matter how much they believe that I can because I can't. I don't have those skills. I don't have that power. And that would be faith poorly placed. No matter how much they believe fervently and want me to be able to fix their car, I can't. I don't have that power. But faith well placed is what we can have in Jesus Christ. So, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, a couple things. First of all, that verse 9 for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We could easily read that and say, oh, so my faith, the intensity of my belief, is what saves me. And I would say, eh, no. That does not jive with the rest of what we see in Scripture. When it says you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls, that means the end result of a faith placed in something reliable, or in this case, someone reliable, the work of Jesus Christ when he laid down his life and then conquered death, uh, that results in the salvation of your souls. And then verse 8, I think, is so powerful because we like things that we can see and measure and touch and verify. And this verse tells us that though you have not seen him, there's a couple things you choose to do. This is the embodiment of your faith, that you love him, you believe in him, and you are filled with the joy that only he can give. Those are results of having a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's a powerful reminder for us. Now, a couple of final points of application, and then we will be done for today. Um, there is something that we often think is true, and it's not. We need to be careful. So let me run this by you, see what you think. How do we know God is for us? Well, we could say, well, we know God is for us because he always makes everything work out smoothly for us. Uh, there's a problem there. Uh, there's actually a couple problems. First of all, that is patently false. Even though we often think that way and believe that, well, if God is really for me, he'll make everything work out. And it, then we go, if things don't work out the way I think they should, then we start to doubt God and say, oh, he must not be for me. But we need to think this through more accurately. If this is not true, then what is true? And I would suggest to you that it would be better expressed this way. We know God is for us because he sent his sinless son, Jesus, 
to pay the sinless penalty for us. That is what is true. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I want to circle us back around to the idea that we started with. That the cross brought heartache and hopelessness. But the empty tomb brought healing and hope. Today we get to celebrate that healing and hope. It doesn't erase all of our suffering, all of our grief, all of our trials. But it gives us hope in the midst of those things, knowing that they will not last forever and that we never face them alone. I'd just like to close with uh, a short section of lyrics from a song. It's actually a Christmas song, but I think this is so appropriate and points to an important truth here for us that no one but Jesus could have accomplished for us what he did. He was the only one qualified. So who could accomplish this for us? Nobody but Jesus. The lyrics read like this, a series of questions, and then finally an answer. It says this, how many kings stepped down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? And how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their son for me? Only one did that for me. Who could accomplish what we needed? Nobody but Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your provision for us. We thank you for the truth of the gospel that came to fruition through what Christ accomplished on the cross and through the empty tomb. I pray that you be with us today as we reflect on what you have done and what that means for us, not just in terms of benefit, but in terms of a responsible and mature response. We thank you. We rejoice in what you have done. We are thankful to you. We are thankful to your son. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us today, and happy Easter. <laughs>